In 2017, a tragic incident shocked Fort Wayne, Indiana, when young couple Noel Renee Trice and Brian Keith Lash were found dead in their home after a party. As investigators dug deeper into the case, they uncovered shocking secrets and unexpected twists. Despite initial setbacks, new witnesses emerged years later, leading to a breakthrough in the case and the arrest of a suspect. But was justice truly served? Join us as we unravel the mystery behind this chilling crime. What could have driven someone to commit such a heinous act? And how did the truth finally come to light after so many years? In 2017, Noel Rene Trice, then 25 years old, and Brian Keith Lash, 29 years old, resided in Fort Wayne, Indiana. The couple hosted a few friends at their Weiser Park Avenue home on June 9th to watch basketball. Then, on June 10, 2017, in the late hours of the morning, someone who had been at the party the previous night found Noel and Brian's lifeless bodies inside their house. Officers were dispatched to the scene, where they discovered blood all over the house. Police questioned the couple's family members who informed them about the little get-together they had the night before their lives were snatched. After compiling a list of every guest, investigators conducted interviews with each one. They found out that their actual reason for being there wasn't to watch the basketball game or enjoy some barbecue, but to buy marijuana from Noel. Noel was reportedly well known for selling high-grade marijuana for thousands of dollars per pound. Authorities were unable to connect any of the guests to the crimes, and after a while, the case was put on hold. Though the case had been dismissed, new information continued to surface. In July 2018, a witness reported to police about another guy, named Dustin Neal, that was at the gathering. The witness stated that Neal contacted him roughly 8 in the morning after the party, which was about two hours before the bodies of the victims were discovered. Neal was looking to sell the witness one to two pounds of marijuana instantly. Given that Neal was broke at the time, the witness informed the police they thought it was suspicious. In July 2022, another witness came forward and informed the authorities that Dustin Neal's half-brother, had told them that Neil was accountable for taking Noel's and Brian's life. In October of 2022, police checked in on the half-brother. The half-brother claimed to have heard Neil boast about killing Brian and Noel. The half-brother confessed to the authorities about everything Neil had told him. Neil purportedly broke in via a window of the couple's house, believing no one was there. His intent was to pilfer their marijuana. However, he was spotted by Brian and then, out fear of getting caught, stabbed him to death. He then treated Noel in the same way. In October of 2022, one more witness stepped forward. This witness further asserted that they spoke with Neil regarding the crime. Neil admitted to them that he had taken the lives of five separate people. Later, in October 2022, Neil's cell phone was examined by the authorities and an FBI special agent. Neil's phone was discovered to have ping-tagged cell towers that would have placed him at a friend's house around 3 in the morning and back at the crime site between 6 and 7 a.m. Neil nevertheless maintained throughout multiple police interrogations that he never returned after leaving Noel and Brian's home at midnight. Recently, authorities unearthed new evidence, which at last gave them enough backing to make an arrest. A partial fingerprint, retrieved from Noel Trice's cell phone, was found to match the fingerprint of Dustin Neal. On January 1, 2023, in Wells County, 35-year-old Neal had been charged and taken into custody by the Fort Wayne Police Department and the Allen County Sheriff's Department. He'll shortly be extradited to Allen County. Detective Brian Martin of the Fort Wayne Police Department stated, It goes without saying that we're gratified to be able to officially wrap up this case following Dustin Neal's arrest. To put it simply, Dustin Neal was pretty much familiar to me and one of the case's original investigators I collaborated with, and he had definitely been on our radar. After years of investigation, the arrest of Dustin Neal seemed to bring closure to the tragic case of Noel Rene Trice and Brian Keith Lash. However, lingering questions remain. What motivated Neal to commit such a horrific act? Did he act alone? 
or are there others involved? And perhaps most hauntingly, are there more victims yet to be discovered? As the case reaches its conclusion with Neil's arrest, the mystery surrounding this chilling crime only deepens. What secrets lie hidden beneath the surface waiting to be unearthed? Join the conversation and share your thoughts on this case. What do you believe truly happened that fateful night? And what unanswered questions still linger in your mind? Let's piece together the puzzle and uncover the truth together. In 1984, a series of brutal assaults shocked Connecticut, leaving four women traumatized and seeking justice. Decades later, a breakthrough led to the arrest of the perpetrator. But who was behind these horrifying crimes, and what was their motive? Join us as we delve into the chilling details of the investigation, the courtroom drama, and the eventual sentencing. How did the accused respond to the allegations? And how did the victims cope with the aftermath? Stay tuned to get the answers. In Connecticut, one man abused and assaulted four different women between the months of June and July in 1984. The four victims were merely designated as Jane Doe 1, 2, 3, and 4. Their names were never made public. All four victims were alleged to have been blindfolded and assaulted inside their respective houses by an unknown intruder. They all claimed that the assailant had been going through their personal stuff, consuming food that was in the fridge, and left the water taps running. Investigators were able to establish a connection between the four crimes because the perpetrator's DNA retrieved from the crime scenes indicated that only one guy was accountable. Sadly, in 1984, DNA technology wasn't yet advanced enough to identify this unknown attacker. The crimes transpired in the Connecticut towns of Windsor, Rocky Hill, Bloomfield, and Middletown. Detectives worked non-stop to find any clues that could point towards the person responsible for the atrocities, but over time, leads eventually dried up or failed to materialize. Finally, in 2020, investigators had a breakthrough when Michael Sharp was linked to the cold cases thanks to DNA testing. In the end, Sharp's DNA was found to match that of recovered from the linens, towels, and laundry clothing taken from crime sites. This evidence connected Sharp to the four cases. For comparison, investigators collected DNA from his trash, which confirmed that he was, in fact, the culprit. The 69-year-old Marlboro, Connecticut resident Michael Marion Sharp was taken into custody in November of 2020. Chief State's Attorney Richard Colangelo stated in a statement that with this arrest, the victims of these atrocities, who have been waiting for their assailant to be brought to justice for over three decades, are now finally relieved that he will be held accountable for his misdeeds. After Sharp was arrested, Supervising Assistant State's Attorney John F. Fahey, head of the Cold Case Unit, released a statement. He added that using forensic genetic genealogy as a potential breakthrough for unresolved cases demonstrates how the investigators in these units never forget of the victims of these crimes. In the past, Sharp served as the group's chief executive officer and oversaw the tuition-free charter school named Umoki Academy in Hartford. In November 2022, Sharp's trial started in the Hartford Superior Court. Three of the women were present in court, and the fourth one participated through a video conference. All four gave testimony on the nighttime attacks in their bedrooms and the resulting trauma that affected them for the rest of their lives. Sharp's family members were also present and requested sympathy from Judge Frank Dadabo. Authorities claim that because Sharp's family provided DNA samples to the GED Match website in 2020, they were able to track him out. The DNA sample extracted from Sharp's cheeks, as well as from the trash outside his house, matched the DNA discovered at the crime scenes. Experts in forensics informed the jury that there was a 1 in 7 billion possibility of that DNA to be of someone else's other than Sharp. The first victim, a 25-year-old resident of a Bloomfield apartment, testified that on June 3, 1984, a male intruder had broken into her house and assaulted her. She reported to the police that when Sharp entered her home, she had been asleep in her bedroom. 
He covered my mouth with his hand and threatened to shoot both myself and my roommate if I make any noise. Over the course of a five-day trial, a state jury in Hartford deliberated for less than an hour before reaching a unanimous decision and ruled out Sharp as guilty on all eight counts of abduction. At the time, he could not be prosecuted with assault because there was a five-year statute of limitations. However, charges of abduction have no such limitations. Following that, Sharp expressed regret to the women but claimed he had no remembrance of the acts due to memory issues. I'm not sure what happened. I don't know, but I'm really sorry, he stated. You deserve so much better. No one should ever enter your home and violate you. If I was that person, if I was that monster, I hope that he is no longer alive inside of me after those two months of my life. Sharp, at the age of 71, was sentenced to 72 years in prison on January 9, 2023, for committing the crime. A minimum of 40 years in prison was the verdict delivered by Hartford Court Judge Frank Dadabo. The judge compared the suffering that Sharp's victims went through with lifelong sentences. The horrific crime he committed would stay with those four women for the rest of their lives. Sharp was referred to as a predator by the judge. The judge in the case stated, You fit that definition, someone who mercilessly exploits others. Chief State's attorney Patrick Griffin stated that the sentencing today proves that years of tireless efforts and cooperation amongst multiple authorities in the quest for justice can ultimately culminate in a fruitful outcome. In order to solve these challenging cases, the detectives and prosecutors in the cold case unit never gave up and turned to the most recent developments in forensic science and other modern technology. As the justice has finally been served, we hope that all of the courageous ladies who testified throughout the trial may feel some closure. Following his sentencing, Sharp had this to say, I simply cannot fathom how could I have committed such a heinous act. I had promised to leave it up to the jury to decide if I really am this monster, and they declared that I was. And so I'm going to have to live by that, Sharp said in the conclusion. After decades of uncertainty and fear, the arrest and sentencing of Michael Sharp bring a sense of closure to the victims and their families. The courtroom drama unfolded with chilling testimonies and a unanimous guilty verdict, yet questions linger. What drove Sharp to commit such heinous acts? Did his memory issues truly cloud his recollection, or was it a convenient excuse? As Sharp begins his 72-year sentence, the haunting question remains. Are there more victims, more cases waiting to be unearthed? Join the conversation and share your thoughts on this harrowing case. What do you think drove Sharp's actions, and how can we prevent such tragedies in the future? Let your voice be heard as we reflect on the aftermath of this chilling saga. Situated on the north bank of the Columbia River, Vancouver is a city in Clark County, Washington. It's renowned for its picturesque views. Because of the low rate of crime among the majority of its communities, Vancouver is frequently referred to as the Hollywood of the North. Though most of the population concurs that living in Vancouver is secure, there are still certain dangers to consider. That takes us back to a horrific tragedy that took place in the year 1974. Martha Murray Morrison was born somewhere around 1956 in Eugene, Oregon. She grew up with her sister, Reba. The two daughters got along well, regardless of their mother's deafness. In addition, Martha dedicated a lot of her time to learning sign language. This enabled her to take care of her mother throughout most of her childhood. Martha was briefly placed in foster care while she was living in Lane County, Oregon. She attended Roosevelt High School in Portland, along with Corvallis Farm School in Corvallis. Martha had a history of drug use and abuse, running away from both her foster and biological family's homes, as well as the Corvallis Farm School. By the year 1974, Martha was a gorgeous 17-year-old with long brown hair and hazel eyes. She traveled to Arizona to enroll in a job program. While there, she met a boy who was a fellow student, 
In mid-1974, the two relocated to Portland together. That boy was believed to be Martha's boyfriend, and he worked as a welder at the shipyards. Although they wouldn't argue much after a disagreement on September 1, 1974, Martha gave up on him and rushed out of their apartment, carrying a suitcase. Unfortunately, Martha never returned home, and this was the last time her boyfriend saw her alive. The next month, reports surfaced of a strange and unpleasant odor emanating from Vancouver's Dole Valley, a densely wooded area in eastern Clark County. On October 12, 1974, a team of investigators was assembled to look into the problem, and while in the valley, they discovered the remains of two women laid out next to each other. It was challenging to find out the cause of death because the bodies had recently been dumped on the ground, and wildlife had taken its course on them. Nonetheless, the police were summoned to the site. The authorities believed the two ladies to have been murdered, and they had enough evidence to mark the case as a homicide. Dental records promptly identified the first body as 18-year-old Carol Platt Valenzuela, after her husband reported her missing on August 4th of the same year. Carol's husband started to get worried when she failed to return home that evening as planned, after she was last spotted hitchhiking in Vancouver, Washington, on August 2nd, 1974. Over the next few days, he kept looking for Carol, but wasn't able to track her down, and therefore reported her missing to the authorities. On October 25th, 1974, after learning of the discovery and more interrogation, Carol's husband was released after passing a polygraph test. At the time of her disappearance, Carol had left behind twins, who were just 10 months old. Regarding the identification of the second body, all attempts were fruitless. Nevertheless, the initial estimate for the age of this unidentified woman was between 20 and 25. An anthropologist from the University of Washington was assigned to examine the remains. Because of wildlife activity and environmental decomposition, it was tough to pinpoint the exact time or cause of death. However, research showed that before their bodies were discovered, the victims had been dead for a minimum of two weeks. The women may have been slain at different times, although it was probable that they were not slain at the site where they were found in the months leading up to the murder. Unluckily, the forensic facial reconstructions of the unidentified victim, created from frontal and profile shots and featured in newspapers, were not recognized by the general public. The woman's physical attributes were also made public by the investigators, who highlighted her curly textured hair and unsatisfactory dental hygiene. In order to identify the second woman whose remains were found at the crime scene, and to find the perpetrator, a thorough investigation was launched. Nevertheless, the detective's efforts were in vain, since there was not a single piece of information or evidence found at the scene that may lead to the assailant. While serial killers like Ted Bundy and Randall Woodfield were chosen as persons of interest in the homicide cases of these two women, no tangible proof was found that could link them to this incident. Both of the women had their DNA sampled and preserved, in the hopes that it might someday aid in the case's resolution. Despite the greatest efforts of the forensic division and police, the identity of the second woman remained a mystery for many years. With no fresh developments and no new leads, the case grew cold, and eventually ended up being shelved. In 2007, it was discovered by Nikki Costa, the operations manager of the Clark County Medical Examiner Office, that the unidentified remains from the 1974 case had been labeled incorrectly. Some of the bone parts that belonged to the unidentified woman bore the name Carol Platt Valenzuela, the girl whose body was found next to the unidentified woman's. They had to spend decades trying to identify the woman while using the wrong evidence, which cost them a considerable deal of work considering it was initially believed to be an administrative error. In 2010, Reba Morrison and her half-brother started looking into the case of Martha Morrison, who went missing on September 1, 1974, from her Portland residence. 
Reba became upset when she looked over the missing persons report her family had filed for Martha. As it happened, nobody had ever reported Martha missing to the police, and Reba could find no record of a missing person report having been lodged in the year 1974. In 2012, the woman, whose identity is still unknown, had her remains transferred to Bobby Selmark Forensics in Lorton, Virginia, for DNA analysis. In the end, a DNA profile was developed and entered into the database. When the investigators checked in with Reba again in 2013, they asked if the unidentified remains might have been that of Martha Morrison, Reba's sister who had disappeared. Following an effective collection of DNA samples from Reba and her half-brother, the researchers cautiously sent the DNA samples to the University of North Texas in an attempt to obtain further information. The samples taken from Reba and her half-brother were then compared with possible matches to establish a genetic profile. The comparison between the samples and the unidentified remains revealed a few similarities, but not enough to rule out a connection just yet. Subsequently, Martha and the unidentified victim's profile were added to the National Missing and Unidentified Person Database, which is devoted to searching for missing people, as well as identifying human remains. To carry out an exceedingly precise DNA testing, samples of DNA from Reba's family had to be obtained by the Clark County Medical Examiners. Consequently, they obtained a sample of Martha's mother's DNA and performed analysis on it. The results did confirm the DNA match, but were ambiguous about the woman's identity. After a prior unsuccessful analysis, forensic investigators wanted to test another family member, Martha's father. But since he was already deceased, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children volunteered to compensate for Martha's father's exhumation. That way his DNA could be retrieved and compared to the unidentified body. The most recent test findings from 2015 confirmed that the remains were that of Martha Morrison. From then on, the Washington State Police have been looking through evidence from cases involving alleged serial killers to find out if they can be connected to Martha and Carol's murders. The detectives were going through the evidence when they came across a woman's unidentified DNA sample that was found on the grip of an air pistol belonging to a serial killer. When this DNA sample came out to be a precise match to Martha Morrison's, the investigators hit the jackpot. A forensic expert from the Washington State Patrol Lab in Vancouver testified that there was a likelihood of 1 in 30 billion that the partial DNA profile she made from the pistol and Martha's body matched. The serial killer was identified as Warren Leslie Forrest, whose gun tested positive for Martha's DNA. In 2017, Warren was already serving a life term for the July 11, 1974 homicide of 20-year-old Krista Blake, who was last seen boarding Warren's Blue Ford Econoline cargo van near Vancouver's downtown. Warren was arrested on October 2, 1974, under accusations of killing Krista. This was only 10 days before Martha and Carol's bodies were discovered in Dole Valley. Investigators continued to delve into Warren's past, hoping to learn more that could back up their case against him. When Warren was eventually interrogated about this allegation, he denied Carol and Martha's killing. Nevertheless, Warren was indicted with Martha Morrison's murder, following the testimony of forensic experts from the Washington and Vancouver State Patrol Lab, who stated that the gun's partial DNA profile and the partial DNA profile from Martha's remains matched. 2019 saw the filing of a new murder conviction against Warren by prosecutors using this new evidence. However, he will still serve his punishment for the earlier crimes. When Warren's trial began in January 2023, more than 30 witnesses who had provided information against him testified. Those who attended the trial included the families of Diane Gilchrist, 14, and Jamie Grissom, 16, in addition to the remaining six girls and women whom Warren is accused of killing. Norma John Lewis was invited to testify for the prosecution, 
in an attempt to establish that Warren, then 74, had a history of abducting, assaulting, and killing women in the early 1970s. Another victim of Warren's, Norma John Lewis, was just 15 years old when she escaped from his abduction and abuse around the same year that Martha went missing. Norma managed to sneak out onto a road and sought rescue after Warren had left her to die, binding her to a tree in 1974. Norma testified in court during Warren's 2023 trial, stating that Warren had approached her right away when she left the Oregon Environmental Council after her shift to go to her next volunteering job. Warren came up to her and asked if she would be interested in modeling. Warren was quite convincing, so Norma consented to go with him and boarded his blue van. Subsequently, he is said to have driven her to Washington Park in Portland, where he tried to strangle her and threatened her with a knife. Warren released Norma from the car with a rope around her neck, then constrained her to his trunk, shot her several times with an air pistol, which was taken as evidence in Martha's case, choked her until she fainted, hid her with logs, and left her for dead, as per Norma's testimony in court. Warren was never prosecuted for the atrocities he committed towards Norma. As to Norma's statement, her only aim was to bring clarity to the families who were unaware of the whereabouts of their loved ones. Many of the parents of Warren's young victims passed away without getting the answers about what happened to their daughters. The only person who survived Warren's murders, Norma, asserted that she knew exactly how those girls would have felt, and that all she wished was for Warren to be held accountable for the atrocities that he committed, and to offer some closure to the victims' families. Sean Downs, Warren's defense attorney, claimed there was no evidence regarding when or how Martha had died. He also mentioned that no one has ever documented the exact day she disappeared. Sean asserted that Warren and Martha were complete strangers, and that any charges made against him related to Martha were only theoretical. He continued by pointing out several differences between Martha's case and Warren's prior attacks. The location where the body of Warren's other victim Norma had been found, and where Martha's remains were discovered, was totally different. The parks of Clark County, where Warren was once employed in one of the departments, had nothing to do with the location of Martha's murder scene. During the concluding statement, Lauren Boyd, the prosecutor for Clark County, claimed that the DNA evidence and Warren's prior history of kidnapping, assaulting, and ditching young women in rural Clark County in 1974 proved his plot to murder Martha beyond a reasonable doubt. In court, Lauren stated that Martha's blood didn't fall unintentionally on Warren's air gun. She went on to claim that there was no other possible explanation since the only way the blood could have ended up there was if Warren had killed Martha. On February 1, 2023, a jury in southwest Washington declared Warren Leslie Forrest, an alleged serial killer, guilty of first-degree homicide in the murder of Martha Morrison. He was properly given an additional life sentence on February 17, 2023, for the heinous crime he had carried out in 1974. A sense of solace was felt by the families of Warren's reported victims, who understood that justice had been served for the time being. Though nothing could ever bring back their loved ones Warren had stolen from them, they were fulfilled that the truth had finally come to light, and that Warren would pay for his crimes. At this time, their best course of action would be to move on with their life while continuing to treasure the memories of the people they lost. Martha's half-brother, Michael Morrison, stated that additional investigation had to be done to find Warren's other potential victims. For him, the situation extended beyond the killing of his sister and encompassed the years of agony which all the families endured. Warren is currently the primary suspect in at least five of the homicide investigations, and the detectives won't give up until they have solid evidence linking him to the atrocities he perpetrated. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us.
as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.